Welcome, everybody, and thank you for taking time to uh, spend with us this evening. As Parker said, I'm going to talk about backyard birds, but more than just that, not only birds in your backyard, but your side yard, your front yard, birds you find in your neighborhood. In other words, I'm going to talk about common birds that we find in and around the city here and the surrounding areas, and uh, some of which occur in your yard. So depending upon where your backyard, front yard and side yard are, that will depend on what kind of birds we're going to find in those yards. Now, I think it's obvious the kinds of birds that you'll get in your yard depends on, first of all, where your house and your yard are, kind of vegetation you have in the yard, and the habitat surrounding your house and your neighborhood. And if you've got a house down in Midtown, you're surrounded by a bunch of other houses, that will determine certain kinds of birds that you can get, like maybe house sparrows and house finches. Uh, if you're, uh, say, up in the North Valley, you're surrounded probably by sagebrush desert, and that will give you a whole different kinds of birds that you can get in your yard. If you're up in the forest somewhere, like along the uh, living up along the Mount Rose Highway or in the uh, Tahoe Basin, then you're going to get a bunch of different birds there than you would get down in the valley. So um, what I'm going to do is talk about the kinds of birds that I've seen in my yard over the years. I live in Hidden Valley on the east side of the city. Um, this is part of my front yard. Um, looking towards the back, you can see I've got uh, this shrub, shrubby vegetation hillside behind us, which has certain kinds of birds. Um, so if you are looking for birds in your yard and you wanna get birds in your yard, keep in mind that birds need at least four things. They need shelter or cover, places to, to hide stay away from predators and so on. Obviously they need food and they need water and they need nest sites. So here in my backyard, we provide a lot of cover. You can see, I guess this house and yard is over 35 years old. So there's a lot of mature trees and vegetation in here. Notice how the vegetation is multi-layered. You've got some that's way up high for birds that prefer to feed high, including tall pine trees like that. There's some smaller junipers and so on for birds that like to be at lower elevation. And then I always plant various kinds of flowering plants, lots of annuals and some perennials. So those flowers uh, can produce seeds for birds and they also attract things like hummingbirds and so on. So a multi-layered vegetation uh, scheme will bring you far more birds. Here's a, a partial view of my front yard. Um, again, vegetation out there. You look to the left of this scene and there's the side of my yard with still more vegetation and even some water for birds. So for food, of course the vegetation itself will provide food as well as cover for birds. But I also put out a, a hopper feeder. That's what this is called, the hopper feeder. And then of course a squirrel guard to keep the squirrels from eating it all. And this is referred to as a finch feeder for smaller birds like goldfinches. Of course, Hummingbird feeders, if I want to have hummingbirds in the yard. And then here's water sources, a bird bath. If you can't get anything else, at least get yourself a shallow bird bath. You will attract far more birds with water than you will with seed because not all birds eat seed, but all birds need water and all birds like to bathe. This is a, an older fountain that we used to have. It's been replaced by another one that you'll see in some of my other photos later. So there's food and there's water. Uh, as far as the water is concerned, it's going to freeze in the wintertime unless you winterize it. You can get this electric heater, uh, probably any nursery. This one I got from uh, Moana Nursery and got it hooked up. So uh, if you want to keep water for the birds in the wintertime, be sure you get an electric heater and winterize that water source. Uh, <clears throat> vegetation, of course, provides nest sites for the birds, but I also have oh, I don't know, five or six nest boxes up in the uh, backyard in certain locations. Not only does it provide um, a spot for cavity nesting birds to nest, but it can also be used for winter roosting on cold nights. Birds can get in there and try and get out of the cold. So yeah, if you can get some uh, nest boxes and put them in your yard too. All right, just to show you how much birds or how much birding you can do in your yard, I don't know what the makeup of the, uh, the crowd is tonight. Normally, if uh, this were live, I'd ask you, okay, how many of you birds, can, uh, you people consider yourself to be an expert birder? How many are beginning birders and so on? And usually for this topic, most of the people are beginning birders. Um, and you're just trying to learn how to identify birds. Well, 
if you're going to get into birding, start in your yard. For example, here's one day in 2012, just one day, just looking out our windows, not even trying to specifically look for birds. We got 14 species in that one day. The next day, March 30th, we added five more species. Again, not even working hard, just looking out the window. So in just two days, we identified 19 different species in our yard. As I mentioned earlier, I've been in this house for 18 years. Over the years, we've tallied a number of 75 species in our yard, three more in nearby areas. So in 18 years, we saw almost 80 different species. So your yard is a great place to start learning how to identify birds. So let's start talking about backyard birds. First of all, if you want to identify birds and you're just getting into it, you need to know what kind of bird is it? Is it a duck? Is it a woodpecker, a sparrow, a hawk? You have to learn the characteristics of the families. And if you get yourself a good bird guide, uh, you can find all these different kinds of families in it and start learning the characteristics. We don't have time to do that tonight, so I encourage you to start going through your bird guide. You also need to know what is its shape and what is its size. And I should probably also say add color here. You know, when you think about it, anytime you see a bird, there's probably three things that come into your mind immediately. Color, size, and shape. You know, hey, did you see that little brown bird fly over? Oh, hey, did you see that yellow bird go land in that tree? You immediately start forming an opinion of the size, the shape, and the color. So you need to start learning different kinds of birds have different kinds of colors and shapes and sizes. And then what habitat are you in? As I mentioned before, the habitat that surrounds your house and yard will determine the kind of birds you've got. If you've got lawn in your yard, you may get robins. If you've got trees in your yard, you may get things like warblers. If you are living anywhere near marshes or wetlands, you're liable to get things like the red-winged blackbird. And of course, no one here is living near the seashore where you would get shorebirds, but we do have lakes and ponds. And if you are close to a lake or a pond in town, you're liable to get some shorebirds that are passing through in migration. Another thing to learn is the different parts of a bird, what we call the topography of a bird or the field marks. Now, every bird guide has got some kind of diagrams like this that list the different parts of a bird. And I'm not going to take time to go through them all now because it would just bore you and put you to sleep. But I am going to mention several of those different um, topography characteristics as we go throughout the presentation. So here, let's go with our basic American robin. I think everybody, most people at least, if not everybody knows what a robin looks like. If you took a robin or any bird and if you drew a line right through it, um, dividing it from the upper part and the lower part, we call everything above the line the upper parts, everything below the line is the under parts. And then we can start labeling different parts of the bird. For example, the top of the head is called the crown. Birds have a forehead, upper and lower mandibles. There's the side of the bird, the flank. Uh, these uh, these feathers that cover the top of the tail are called upper tail coverts. This part of the back is called the rump. These under tail coverts, if you want to impress your friends, they're referred to as the chrism, and so on. So we label the different parts of the bird, and I'll be talking about some of those, mention them as we go through the presentation. So <clears throat> backyard birds. Well, first of all, there are birds that are here all year round. We call them resident birds or permanent residents. And then there are some birds that come up here from the south come up here in the summer to breed. And after they're done breeding, then they migrate back south again. And then we have birds that just pass through. Uh, we call those migrants. And then there are birds that come from the north and come down here and stay in here throughout the winter. And we call those winter birds. So let's start with some common resident birds first. And I'm gonna start with our common American robin. Um, I'm doing that because it's good for comparing, I'm sorry, my, PowerPoint is acting up on me here. Um, their <clears throat> American robin is about 10 inches in length. And we use that as a good comparison. Uh, it helps to have a couple of different sized birds in your mind when you're trying to figure out what a bird is. American robin, we'll start with that at 10 inches. Then there are other birds that are smaller than robins, all the way down to the smallest birds, the hummingbirds. Sparrows, finches, and wrens are smaller than robins, five to six inches. And then there are birds that are larger than robins, like certain hawks, like Cooper's hawk, up to 14 inches. American crow, I think most of you recognize a crow as being bigger than a robin, 17 and a half inches. And you can even go up to great horned owl, 22 inches. 
whenever someone used to call me at the university and tell me, you know, can you tell me what this bird was I saw in my yard? There was some yellow in the wing and some white in the tail. The first thing I would ask them is, what size is it? Is it not the size of a robin? Is it bigger than a robin, smaller than a robin? Once you get the size down, you can eliminate all other birds that are not in those different size ranges. So American robin is a good one to use as a basis. Now, when you look at American robins, <laughs> I had a friend once said, you know, you see one robin, you see them all. Well, not really. During the breeding season, you can actually tell male from female. And when you can tell the two different sexes apart, we say that species is dimorphic. Di meaning two, morph meaning the appearance, two appearances. Look at the head color. The male American robin has got a really dark black head, whereas females are lighter colored. And they also have, both male and female, have what we call a partial or broken eye ring. If this color goes all the way around, we call it an eye ring, but this one is not complete, so we call it a partial or broken eye ring. So here we can tell male from female, at least in the breeding season, because the male's head is darker than the female. So they are dimorphic. You also need to learn how to tell the young birds from the adults. Because in many cases, the young birds don't look very much like the adults at all. In fact, some cases, they look very, very different. So here's a young American robin. If you're lucky enough to have some robins nesting in your yard later this summer, you'll probably see some of these. When they leave the nest, we call them a fledgling or a juvenile or immature. Uh, robins belong to the thrush family, and all thrushes have this characteristic. When the fledglings leave the nest, they have all these spots on them, spots on the upper sides, and spots on the undersides. So that would tell you that that's a robin. And in fact, it's a first year bird. It's a bird that just left the nest that year. Another common resident is the European starling, called the European starling because that's where it came from. It came from Europe. Um, there was a fellow who introduced, oh, about 100 birds into Central Park in New York City, some of them in 1890, others in 1891. And from those 100 birds, there are now more than 200 million European starlings all across North America, up into Alaska, down into Mexico, and so on. The species, when you look at it, it looks like it's monomorphic. Mono meaning one, morph, of course, referring to appearance. In other words, in the wintertime, at least, you can't tell male from female. They look monomorphic. But I'll show you later, they're actually slightly dimorphic. Here's the way the uh, European starling looks after it molts in the fall. Once they're done breeding, the starlings have one molt a year. And when they do molt, the tips of the feathers have all these white spots on them. And I've had people ask me what this bird is. I've even had some people I know had this bird in their hand and couldn't tell what it was. Because when you say starling, what do you think of? You think of a black bird, right? Well, here's a bird that's got all kinds of white spots on it. Well, as it continues to do whatever it does throughout the winter and the spring, the tips of those feathers start to wear off just due to plain wear. And eventually by the time the breeding season comes around, most of the tips are worn off and the bird then tends to look black. But another change that takes place towards the end of winter and early spring is the color of the bill starts to change. It's all black in the wintertime. As the day length gets longer, day length stimulates the reproductive system of birds. And the reproductive system starts putting out the reproductive hormones. And those hormones cause the beak of the starling to start changing yellow. So the base is yellow, the tip is black. The yellow continues to extend out until you've got a completely yellow bill. And then the bird is in the breeding season in the spring and summer. So black bill in the winter, partial bicolored bill, late winter, early spring, and then a completely yellow bill when the bird is in breeding condition. And when it's in breeding condition, <clears throat> then they're slightly dimorphic. You can tell male from female. Check the base of the beak. If it has a pinkish color, it's a female. If it has a bluish color, it's a male. So just like we humans, blue for a boy, pink for a girl. So they are slightly dimorphic, at least during the breeding season. Now here's what the young birds look like. This is a juvenile, an immature. Doesn't look anything like the adult at all, except for the overall shape, size, and maybe the beak. It tends to look brownish or grayish. And if you had these guys nesting in your yard and the fledglings came out, left the nest, and you were looking at them, you'd have no idea what they are. They just look like a little grayish or charcoal colored ball of fluff. So 
These are fledgling starlings. And as they get larger, they tend to take on a brownish or sometimes grayish, depending upon how the light hits them. And they look very different than the adult. But notice this guy is starting to molt into some adult black feathers right there. So there's a juvenile European starling and an adult European starling. Now, anybody who has a house probably has these guys around. These are called house sparrows. They're also known as the English sparrow because they too were brought over from England in uh, 1850 and the 1870s. They were brought over because people thought maybe they could help control insect pests that were um, uh, farmers were having troubles with, with their crops. But it turned out they preferred to eat grain in the droppings of horses and cattle instead of the insects. And they eventually spread till they're all across North America now too. They're strongly dimorphic. This is a male. And in most birds, like this house sparrow, the males tend to be more brightly colored than the females. Here the male has got this black on the breast. We refer to it as a bib. It's got this kind of a, I guess, reddish chestnut color going back from the eye. Whoops. Oh, God, that thing is driving me nuts here. Sorry. Uh, this chestnut color on the wings. And if you see a color like a bar going across the wing, we call that a wing bar. So it's got a white wing bar, a black bib, grayish on the top of the head or the crown, and this chestnut going back from the eye. And other than that, what we call clear undersides, no streaks or spots at all. Here's the female, looks very different, just a drab brown, brownish on the head, clear brownish undersides. She has some striping on the back and on the wings, but she also has what we call an eye line, a line that goes through the eye is referred to as an eye line. And above the eye, there is a different line here, slightly different buffy color. We call that an eyebrow. Or again, if you want to impress your friends, you call it a supercilium. Super meaning above, cilium, I guess, referring to the eye, above the eye. So there's the female. And here they are, male above, female below. I think this gives you a better look at the eyebrow and the eye line here of the female. Most of us also probably have house finches in and around our house. And the house finch is about the same size as the house sparrow, maybe a little bit bigger, but it's got, the male at least, has got this red on the forehead that goes as an eyebrow over the eye. Sometimes there's a little eye line there. It's got the red on the chin and the throat down onto the breast and then streaks on the belly. Here's a look at several different house finches. Some people often say the house finch has got a red head. Well, not really. It's really just a red forehead that extends back over the eye. Some guys may look like they've got some red on the head, but it's mostly more brown than it does red. Uh, and there's the rump. The posterior third of the back is called the rump, and male house sparrows have a reddish rump. Here's the female, much different, just a, a nondescript brownish streaking looking sparrow. Although it's not a sparrow, it's a finch. Um, all these streaks on the bottom, just kind of brownish all over. There may or may not be uh, an apparent wing bar there. But also notice that both on the male and the female, the upper mandible is curved. And that's going to be important a little bit later when I talk about another finch. So here's a female house, uh, house finch and a male house finch feeding at my upper feeder. Each one about six inches long. Now, within the population, male house finches can have color variations. These guys tend to look a little bit orangish or yellowish. Not all of them, in other words, are reddish, like I showed you earlier. Here's one that looks yellowish. Another one that's yellowish on a finch feeder next to a male house sparrow. This is a yellowish variant. We don't know what causes those variations. Uh, some people think it may be due to not getting enough food in their diet, the proper food to produce the uh, pigment, to produce the red. Others think it may have something to do with what they call a parasite load. Too many parasites, the bird is too weak to metabolically produce the red color. I don't know that anyone's ever found a real solution to that question yet. So looking at birds at your feeder, what do we got here? Well, this is obviously a male house finch. You can see the red there and on the rump, but what are these two? Well, let's take a look. One of the problems that a lot of beginning birders have is trying to distinguish a female house sparrow from a female house finch. So here's a female house sparrow here. Remember, it's got that supercilium and an eye line. 
And notice on the back, they tend to have these, what kind of tend to look like orangish stripes on the back. The house finch, female house finch, doesn't have an eyebrow, doesn't have an eye line, and it doesn't have all of those orange streaks on the back. So that's one way to tell them apart. If you can see the undersides of the bird, notice, remember, house sparrows have clear undersides, whereas house finches, females, have streaked undersides. That would be the easiest way to tell them apart if you can see the underside. Streaked on the female house finch, clear on the female house sparrow. So go back here, what do we got? I don't see any orange streaks here, so I'm assuming this is a female house finch. This I assume is a female house sparrow. There's the eyebrow and the eye line, and there's a white wing bar there. And although it doesn't show well, there are no streaks on the underside, clear undersides. So female house sparrow, female house finch. And of course, I think everybody recognizes California quail. Most of you, uh, if you've got lawn and feeders, you probably have California quail come. I can get sometimes 80 to 100 of them in my yard during the winter time. They are dimorphic. You recognize the male by more brightly colored with this black chin and throat and the white uh, bordering it. And the top knot is different. What we call the head plume or top knot. It's stronger and curved black on the male, a very thin on the female. And of course, you don't even need to see the California quail. You can recognize them by their call. Chicago, 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 or escargot, escargot, escargot. You know, you could do 90 to 100% of your birding if you learn bird songs and bird calls. And of course, we can't get into that tonight, but most species of birds have distinctly recognizably different songs and calls. And you can buy all kinds of tapes and uh, CDs that you can use to try to learn them. I can lay in my bed in the morning and say, okay, I hear a morning dove out front. I hear a California quail in the backyard and on and on and on. So try to learn to bird by ear too, if you get a chance. Now here's the morning dove. I think everyone recognizes morning doves, uh, 12 inches, so a little bit bigger than a robin. Now there's a definite eye ring. See that bluish eye ring around the black eye? And then the rest of the bird is sort of brownish or grayish, depending upon how the light hits it. Black spots on the on the uh, wing coverts, and then these reddish legs and feet. Pointed tail, they're monomorphic, can't tell male from female. Uh, and during the breeding season, you'll often see them coming in pairs. I've often thought that <laughs> the head is ridiculously small for a bird of that size, but nobody asked me. So that's how it looks perched on a branch. But when it's flying, you can also recognize it by that V-shaped tail with white outer tail feathers. Very, very distinctive. The morning dove. And it's got, well, it's not morning the time of day, it's morning because of the mournful sound to its call, which I really can't imitate, but it's kind of like, ooh, 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 kind of like someone mourning the loss of a loved one, the morning dove. And they're ground feeders primarily. So if they're in your yard, they're probably going to be pecking around on the ground looking for seed that may have fallen from your feeder. And, you know, sometimes you're looking at them and sometimes they look back. I wonder, what are you doing with that camera or those binoculars, whatever. So enjoy them when you can. But check the doves. Not all the doves are morning doves. Some of them we have in North America now are Eurasian collared doves. And as the name implies, they're not native. They came from Eurasia. They were introduced into the Bahamas sometime in the 1970s and somewhere around the middle of the 70s, there was a, I understand, a, a theft at a, at a pet store somewhere and some of the birds uh, escaped. And then eventually the pet store owner released about 50 of them. Somehow they, some of them found their way over into Southern Florida during the 1980s, probably blown over by a storm, who knows. But from Southern Florida, they worked their way north and west and now they're all across the United States except for some reason for the Northeast. They don't occur up there. But they're called the collar dove because of that obvious collar on the back of the neck. There's the collar. They have an eye ring just like the morning dove, but notice it's a square cut tail as opposed to the pointed tail that the morning doves had. So there's that pointed tail of a morning dove. There's a square cut tail of the Eurasian collar dove. And when they fly, easy to recognize them. Again, the morning dove has that V-shaped tail with white outer tail feathers. Whereas the Eurasian collared dove, it just sort of has this circular tail. 
with what we call a white terminal band, terminal mean at the end, which is very different, excuse me, than the V-shaped tail of the morning dove. So two doves, morning dove and Eurasian collar dove. I have Eurasian collar doves. They started showing up in my yard about, oh, five or six years ago. And now I get them every year coming to my feeders. I think they nest in one of the neighbor's yards and so on. Okay, you put out a finch feeder and you're gonna get these guys, the lesser goldfinch. Um, they kind of look greenish on the back with black wings with white edges, uh, yellowish on the undersides like this here. They are dimorphic. This is the male. The male has got a black cap on the crown, the top of the head. It extends back to the base of the head. This area back here at the back of the neck is called the nape. So a black cap going back to the nape. This greenish back, uh, as I said, black wings with white edges. There's also a black tail with white spots in them. Small birds, only four and a half inches long, much smaller than your American robin. There's a female. This part of the body looks much like the male down here, but no black cap, okay? So there's a male lesser goldfinch with the black cap, female goldfinch without black cap. Put out a finch feeder, you're liable to get lots of them. I certainly do. Here's, uh, let me see, one, I don't know if you guys can see my, uh, my arrow, I hope you can. I get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's nine lesser goldfinches there. And I see some red, so that's probably a male house finch back there. Now, another goldfinch you can get at those feeders is the American goldfinch. During the breeding season, the male looks so different from the lesser goldfinches. Easy to recognize. Look at all that bright yellow color. There's black on the head that only goes about halfway back on the head. And then black and white wings. And notice that the under tail coverts are white. So in the American goldfinch, white under tail coverts, or chrism as we call it. Whereas on the lesser goldfinch, those under tail coverts are yellow. Here's two more lesser goldfinches. You don't even need to see the bird. If you see the yellow chrism, you know you've got a lesser goldfinch. Here you can't see this entire bird. No, it's yellow, but look at the white chrism. That tells you it's an American goldfinch. And why do I even bother to tell you that when that male looks so different from the male lesser? Well, it's because in the fall, the male molts into this kind of plumage and looks like a female. So during the winter, the plumage looks like this. And then it can sometimes get difficult to tell it from a lesser goldfinch. Sometimes they have this yellow up here on the chin and throat. Mostly a brownish back, but the wings and tail look very similar to that of a lesser goldfinch, but you don't have all that bright yellow on the undersides. So in the wintertime, I can get something like this at my finch feeders. And now I have to look at them and try to decide, okay, which ones are lesser goldfinches, which ones are American goldfinches? Well, I always go by the color on the back. There's greenish here. That's a black cap and yellow. So that's obviously a male lesser goldfinch. This one is brownish, so that's an American. This one is brownish, that's American. This one's got that little yellowish and brownish, that's an American. This one's got the brownish back, so that's American. This one is brownish with the yellow up there on the chin and throat, that's American. Same thing here, American. That's American. Whoops. That greenish and yellowish black cap, that's a lesser goldfinch, another American, that's another lesser goldfinch, you can see greenish up there, American there, American there, all this yellow here, I think that's a lesser, and that one is American there. So that's how you can tell them apart in the winter time. Now watch the American goldfinches, if you have them in your yard in the winter, late winter, early spring, the males will start molting the other breeding plumage. Here you can see the brownish winter feathers being replaced by the bright yellow and some black coming in on the head. Here's another example of a molting American goldfinch male in the early spring. Another example, just this blotchy looking color. They still have some of the winter plumage here. There's some black coming in on the head and yellow coming in on other parts of the body. Eventually you get to, oh, let's say mid to late March and there you go, they're almost there in their breeding plumage. Then they're easy to tell apart from the lesser goldfinches. But late spring, what do we got at the feeder? Now that's obviously an American goldfinch in molt. That's an American male goldfinch in molt. This, well, that's kind of greenish. I think that's a female lesser. This is obviously a male lesser goldfinch. 
This is a female American goldfinch. See, it's still brownish there. A male American in molt. These two are greenish, so I think these are female lesser goldfinches. And then, of course, you recognize these as house finches here and here. Okay. So I wish we had people could ask questions if we were in person, but we can't. So I'm going to move on and hope that wasn't too fast for you. So we go back to this one again. I think we'll skip it because I already went through it. All right, at this point, I would ask people, okay, how many of you people saw a blue jay in your yard? And I would say a half to two thirds of the crowd would raise their hand. Well, you saw a blue jay, but you didn't see a blue jay, if you know what I mean. We have four blue jays here in Nevada, but we don't have a blue jay. This is a blue jay, and it's an eastern and central bird. You look at the range map all through the east and through the central part of the U.S., east of the Rockies, basically. We don't have blue jays in Nevada. This is what the blue jay looks like. This is called a necklace here. They do have a crest. If the feathers are raised up like that on the head, we call it a crest. And then all this bluish and black throughout the rest of the body. Out here, we have probably the most common one is the California scrub jay. It was formerly called the Western scrub jay, but now they've split it apart into two species, which I'll mention in a minute. California scrub jay, long blue tail, bluish across the back, except for some grayish here on the upper part of the back. We've got a white eyebrow a black area covering the ear. And on the undersides, whoops, the underside you've got this, what we call a kind of a silverish or whitish color necklace down here. They're monomorphic, can't tell male from female. If you wanna have fun, put out a peanut feeder and you can watch these guys come in here and pick out peanuts, drop the ones they don't like and fly off with the others. Look at how long that tail is. That tail is almost as long as the body. And there's that characteristic black or grayish on the back. Now, used to be, like I say, the Western scrub jay. Now, a couple of years ago, they split it into the California scrub jay and the Woodhouse scrub jay. And I only bring this up because look at the range map. There's a California scrub jay along the coast and by Jingo down here into our area. Woodhouse scrub jay is mostly in the interior of Nevada and interior Southwest, but look, they can occur down in our area. And generally kind of more commonly found south of Reno and Sparks. But to tell them apart, the California scrub jay is a darker blue than the woodhouses. The woodhouses is paler blue than the California scrub jay. You've got a darker and extending farther down onto the breast, the blue breast band that tends to fade out on the woodhouses scrub jay. And then the California scrub jay is mostly whitish underneath, whereas the woodhouses is grayish. So all the ones that I've seen in my yard all I can say is they're probably California scrub jays and they're all out there grabbing peanuts from my peanut feeder and they take them and they dig a hole and they cache them in the ground. And then they'll come back later to pick up those peanuts and feed on them. And they have to be careful because if another scrub jay sees them digging the hole and caching them, the scrub jays will come in and steal them from them. They're well known to be cache robbers, California scrub jay. So here's another blue jay in Nevada. This is the Stellar's jay. It's the only J out west with a crest, as you can see here. Blackish on the head and down on part of the back. The rest of it is this brilliant blue. This is the one that's often referred to as the J of the Tahoe Basin. They tend to be in pine forest, although I have seen them at lower elevations along with California scrub jays. California scrub jays tend to be, as the name implies, in scrubby bushy habitats, bushy hillsides. But I get them in my yard. And all I have to do is put some peter, peanuts out in my peanut feeder. And one of these guys, the Stellar's Jays, will show up out of nowhere. I don't know where it comes from or how it knows the peanuts are there, but it doesn't. On the forehead, these feathers may be blue. In some populations, they're whitish. But I think it's a very characteristic looking bird. Here's a look at the wings of the bird. And there it is compared to the California Scrub Jay. Very easy to tell the two apart. A little bit larger than a, a robin, 11 and 11 and a half inches. And then there they are compared to the Eastern Blue Jay up here. So we don't have Blue Jays here. We have Blue Jays, but we don't have Blue Jays. All right, enough of that. Here's our fourth Blue Jay in Nevada. This is the Pinyon Jay. The Pinyon Jay, as the name implies, occurs in Pinyon Forest or mixed Pinyon Juniper Forest. 
they've got this big honker of a beak that they use to pry nuts out of the pine cones and then they can stick them in their little uh, throat here and carry off a whole bunch at a time and then go cache them somewhere. Notice they're basically all blue. Short tail. The tail is shorter than in the other jays that sometimes referred to as the little blue crow because when they walk on the ground they kind of strut like a crow does. So that's the pinyon jay. Pinyon jay compared to the stellar jay and the California and Woodhouse's scrub jay. I think they're relatively easy to tell apart. Okay. Pinyon jays are, are very, uh, very, um, that's the word I'm looking for, very uh, noisy. They, they uh, often nest in colonies and they'll fly around in, in flocks and they make a large, kind of a laughing type call that you often hear before you even see the birds. So three of the four Nevada bluish jays. Now, a relative of the uh, jays, if you live anywhere near open fields, is the black-billed magpie, usually recognizable by its size, 19 inches long, and the bold black and white appearance with that long black tail. When it flies, the outermost feathers, called the primaries, are white, so that black and white appearance. But if you get it in good light, it's actually iridescent. You can get bluish coloration and greenish coloration to the feathers if you get it in just the right light. Monomorphic. Can't tell male from female, the black-billed magpie. Ah, oh, all over town and maybe in New York too, the Brewer's Blackbird. All black, male has this bright yellow eye. You wanna see Brewer's Blackbird, just go to any fast food joint in town like McDonald's or Arby's or whatever. They're usually prowling around on the ground in and among and under the cars looking for any scraps that we humans may have dropped there. The male, it's all this blackish with that bright yellow eye, as I said, but it's iridescent black. You see, when the light hits it just right, you can get this purplish and bluish greenish colorations and so on. Females, brownish to grayish, but again, light hits it just right and you can get this iridescent green color on it. So these guys are, oh, about the size of a robin, nine inches, a little bit smaller, but they're all over town and get them in my yard every now and then. There's a female looking brownish in this photo. And there's the male with that kind of purplish sheen and the yellow eye that you really can't see too well. Strongly dimorphic. If you're anywhere near wetlands, you're liable to get this bird in your yard, the red-winged blackbird. Called red-winged because of the red on the shoulder bordered by yellow. It's referred to as the epaulet. You know, like those epaulets that the generals have on the shoulders of their uniform and so on. Um, apologize, my... PowerPoint keeps backing up on me. Notice the long, sharp beak that it uses for catching insects and so on. Uh, these guys are strongly dimorphic. The females just kind of look like sparrows, although they're bigger than a sparrow, eight and three quarter inches. They've got a white eyebrow and a black eye line, but look at all the streaking on the undersides. You seldom see them because they usually tend to stay down deep in the cattails where the nests are until after the young are fledged. So there's the male red-winged blackbird, and there's the female red-winged blackbird, strongly dimorphic. I'm not any, near any wetlands, but I still every now and then get some red-winged blackbirds coming to my hopper feeder. And again, if you're near any open fields, you're liable to get the western meadowlark, brightly colored yellow on the undersides with this brownish or blackish V on the breast. There's a white eyebrow, and then there's a white line on the top of the head called the median line, median meaning middle. If you look at them from the back, they've got this kind of camouflage coloration because they spend most of their time on the ground. They nest on the ground. And this coloration helps them to blend in with their environment so they hopefully are <clears throat> not easy for a predator to find. They're kind of a chunky bird with a short stubby tail, and white outer tail feathers. When they fly, that tail is distinctive. Here you can see the white eyebrow there. There's a nut, whoops. Here's another look at that stubby tail with the white outer tail feathers. Look at that beak that's just well designed for digging in the dirt looking for things to eat. This small bird is called the bush tit because when they occur in flocks in the non-breeding season, you'll often hear them going tit, 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 and the flock will sort of flow from one bush to another, one bird after another, going tit, 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 tit the whole time really small, four and a half inches. They're mostly brownish to grayish, depending on how the light hits them. 
Look at that tiny beak that they have. And that tail, that tail is almost as long as the body, really a long tail. This bird looks grayish here. They look monomorphic, but if you look closely, they're slightly dimorphic. Males have dark eyes, females have yellow eyes. That's the way to tell them apart. They occur in shrubby hillsides. Remember the photo I showed you of my house. I've got the shrubby hillside behind me. They would be in all those little shrubs there. They will come to your uh, suet feeders like this. So here I've got two yellow-eyed. Those are two female bush tips. They build, for a small bird, they build this incredible long sock-like nest that you would think would be easy to see, but man, they can really hide this thing inside a tree like a pinyon pine or uh, this tree over in California and so on. <clears throat> That's a bush tit nest. Now, we do have woodpeckers that can come into our yard. This is one of the more common ones. This is called the northern flicker, also known as the red shafted flicker. Um, 12 and a half inches long, so it's bigger than a robin, and you'll often see them on the ground. Well, now, wait a minute. Woodpeckers, you're supposed to sing in trees, right? Along the trunk or along the branches. Well, northern flickers like to go down on the ground because their favorite food is ants. And so use that big beak of theirs to dig into the ground, particularly if they can find a uh, colony of ants and they like to feed on the ants. Easily recognizable, the male is anyway, by that red mallar stripe or mustache, as we call it. Got all this brown barring across the back of the wings, all these spots on the undersides. You look at the undersides, there's this black thing that we call a chevron on the breast. Uh, and then again, all the spots and so on. They will come to your uh, suet feeders if you put a suet feeder out. And here, this shows you why they're called the red shafted flicker. You see the shafts of all the feathers have got this orangish to reddish coloration. Now, all woodpeckers have long protrusible tongues that they can use. They use that beak to dig holes in uh, branches and trunks and try to find insects and then use that tongue. The tongue has got sticky secretions and little barbs at the end, so they use that to trap the insects and pull the tongue back. Well, here they use it to get the, uh, uh, the suet out of my suet feeder. Notice the tail. Woodpeckers have got stiff tails that they use to brace themselves against the branch or the trunk of a tree. Here's a female, looks just like the male, except that she doesn't have the mustache. Okay, And here she hadn't learned how to work my suet feeder at first as she was going upside down and sticking her tongue in there to get the suet. This is a smaller woodpecker, probably the smallest woodpecker we have here, only six and three quarter inches. This is the downy woodpecker. The downy woodpecker is black and white. Notice all white underneath. It's got white on the back. The downy woodpecker and the next one I'll mention, the hairy woodpecker, are the only two woodpeckers that have white backs. Wings are black with white spots. They've got black and white heads. If you see red on the back of the head, that's a male. No red on the head, that's a female. There's a better look at the back of the male and the red on the back of the head. There's a female. The outermost tail feathers have black spots on them. And that's to help you tell apart from the one that looks like it, the larger hairy woodpecker. The hairy woodpecker looks just like the, uh, the downy woodpecker, but it's larger, nine and a quarter inches. If you get a look at the tail, no black spots on the outer tail feathers. That's one of the best ways to tell them apart. But sometimes from a distance, size can be hard to tell. And you're not sure if you're looking at a small downy or a large hairy. Well then check the length of the bill versus the length of the head on the bird. In the downy woodpecker, that beak is small. It's not as large as the length of the head. On the hairy woodpecker, the beak is larger, thicker and it is about almost the length of the head itself. So if you can't see the tail feathers and you're not sure of the size, check the size of the beak versus the size of the head. Smaller in the downy, larger in the hairy. Hairy woodpeckers tend to be mostly up in the higher elevations, but you can find them down low. And I have found areas where I find both downy and hairy in the same spot. Now, if you've got any feeders out in your yard, you're probably going to attack predators like hawks, and one of the most common is this small falcon called the American kestrel. Strongly dimorphic, the male is more brightly colored than the female. Uh, recognizable by its size, 10 and a half inches, a little bit bigger than a robin. And the face pattern, 
you got this grayish on the forehead that extends back as uh, over the eye, uh, a rufous crown, rufous means reddish brown, rufous on these uh, wing coverts. Notice the bluish wings here. And then the male has got these spots on the undersides. And then there's these two malar stripes or face stripes, we call them, bordered by white. So that's a recognizable face pattern there. Grayish, rufous, and the two malar stripes on each side of the face. Here's a female. Female, the face pattern and head is the same as the male, but notice no blue on the wings. Easiest way to tell male from female. The female has what I might describe as a tiger stripe pattern on the wings and the back. Okay, So female with no blue in the wings, male with blue in the wings. And then probably more commonly in New York, you can get the Cooper's hawk coming after the birds that come to your feeder. And when it comes to the Cooper's hawk, they can be anywhere from 10 inches to 14 inches. The males are always smaller than the females in hawks. So males will be about 10 inches long. Females can be up to 14 inches long. And what you need to learn for Cooper's hawk is how to tell the immatures from the adults. Immatures tend to be brownish or sometimes grayish. They've got a yellow eye and they've got this brown vertical streaking. The hawk is recognizable because it's got this long tail that extends beyond the wingtips. That tells you it's a Cooper's hawk. It belongs to a group of hawks known as the accipiters. And the accipiters have all these long tails with bands on them that extend long beyond the tip of the wings. So these two are immature birds. The adults, they have this what I call a um, horizontal banding pattern with sort of a rufous uh, coloration that goes down onto the legs and the eye starts turning orange. And then they get this bluish coloration on the head and on the back and the wings. And as they get older, the eye turns red. But here's this horizontal barring on the underside. Orange or red eye tells you it's an adult Cooper's hawk. They're referred to as ambush birds because they'll often sit in a bush or a tree and wait for a small bird to come by and jump out and try to trap it. And they eat mostly small birds, although they will take other small animals. So there's the juvenile, yellow eye, brown vertical streaks, adult, red eye, horizontal barring, okay? It's all you need to know to tell adult from immature. Now there's another species called the sharp shinned hawk that's a smaller version of the Cooper's hawk. Both the adult and the immatures just look like Cooper's hawks, but they're smaller. But this is one of the hardest identification uh, problems for any birder, even, uh, even experienced birders. The sharp shinned hawk, the male's only 10 inches long, but the females can get up to 14 inches. Cooper's hawk, females can get up to 20 inches, but look, males 14 inches. So you've got this overlap in size. And so sometimes it's difficult to tell whether you're looking at a sharp shin hawk or a Cooper's hawk. One thing that will help, I, I apologize for this. I don't know why this keeps happening. Sharp shin hawks, when they're perched, the tail tends to be looking square. So Sharpie square tail, S. Cooper's hawks, the tail often looks curved. So Cooper's hawk with a C, C for a curved tail. That doesn't always work, but sometimes it does. So keep that in mind to tell one from the other. And then of course, probably the most common hawk we have here in Nevada is the red-tailed hawk. Notice the red-tailed hawk belongs to a group called the Budios, and they have short tails that hardly extend beyond the wingtips when the bird is uh, perched. Now, red-tailed hawk because of the red tail, on the undersides, this is your characteristic um, um, field mark. Dark head, light belly, or light breast, dark belly, what we call a belly band. So dark, light, dark. If you memorize that, dark, light, dark, you got a red tail hawk. Dark, light, dark, okay? Go to bed tonight and that's your mantra. Dark, light, dark, red tail hawk. In flight, if you see the red tail, then you know you've got an adult red tail hawk. If you can see the dark, light, dark, that tells you red tail hawk. Of course, if you see the red tail, that's all you need. But another characteristic of red tail hawks is what we call the dark leading edges of the wing. They're the only hawks out here that have dark leading edges. They're referred to as patagial marks, dark leading edges or patagial marks. Okay, so that's an adult red tail hawk. But this is also a red tail hawk. 
even though it doesn't have a red tail. It's got a brown barred tail. The immature birds, the first year birds, the juveniles don't have red tails. They have these barred tails, brown tails with bars on them. So how do I know it's a red tail hawk? Dark, light, dark, okay? Dark, light, dark. That's your key right there, even for the first year red tail hawks. They like to nest in high trees, particularly uh, cottonwoods. So if you've got any cottonwoods in or near your yard, look for a nest with red-tailed hawks. All right, those are permanent residents. Let's look at some common summer breeders. One of the most easiest to recognize is the Bullox Oriole. Look at that, orange and yellowish coloration, black on the head, is black on the back, eight and a quarter inches, smaller than a robin. There's the female much duller color. Look at them, comparison. There's the male, bright orange, black on the back here, black and white wings, oranges on the tail with some black in the middle and the tips. Female, sort of a grayish greenish back, and the head is not as bright orange as the, as the male, and mostly a solid colored tail. These guys were captured at the end of the breeding season. You can see how battered their tails are, and you can see why they, they need to molt at the end of the season before they start activities again. They built this kind of a nest. If you've ever seen this sack-like nest, you know it's from a Bullux Oriole. Both the males and the females will feed the young. Um, they tend to like cottonwoods. So if you've got cottonwoods in the area like this tree here, you're liable to get Bullux Orioles. But look at the nest. What blows my mind is the way they build these nests. Look at the stuff that they've got in here. They'll use long uh, grass fibers, but they can find something else long, like fisherman's line. Uh, I've seen them use dog hair, horse hair, and so on. And they just twist all this thing up into this bag that I've seen some of them are made almost completely from fish line. Uh, amazing that they do that. And both male and female will feed the young. Bullux Oriole. Again, if you're near any wetlands, this is to me one of the first signs of spring here in Northern Nevada, you get the yellow headed blackbird, named for obvious reasons. All black with white patches in the wings, which you see mostly when it flies, and then the head is yellow with black around the eye. There's the female. She's all brownish with some red on the face, I'm sorry, yellow on the face, and some yellow extending down onto the breast. These guys are in uh, wetlands, again, same place where you'll find uh, red wings. And if you're in, near any red uh, wetlands, like down in the Damani wetlands area, you're liable to have yellow-headed blackbirds in and around your yard. Says Phoebe, this is a bird that is a flycatcher. By flycatcher, I mean it's a bird that will sit on a perch, look for a flying insect, sally on out there, catch the insect in the air with this flattish beak of it. The beak opens up into a big flycatching beak and then fly back to Sally back to its perch and eat it. This is sort of a grayish bird, only seven and a half inches long, but it's got this sort of pinkish coloration on the bottom, pinkish to orangish, and it's the only, the only flycatcher that has this kind of coloration on the undersides. And they do very often nest in people's, uh, people's yards up in the rafters of your house and so on. So look out for a Sage Phoebe uh, during the breeding season. If you've got some shrubbery in your house, particularly if you're on a shrubby hillside, you'll be able to get the spotted toady. If you've got an older guidebook, it's also referred to, was referred to as the rufous sided toady because of all this rufous coloration on the side. Mostly blackish up top, black and white wings, a bright red eye if you can get to see it in the black beak, and a long black tail. This is the female, same coloration, except she's duller in color, more grayish instead of blackish on the upper sides. I usually get one or two, sometimes three of these in my yard every year. Buick's wren. The wrens are small brownish birds, only five and a quarter inches or so. And they tend to have a lot of barring on their tail and barring on their wings. This Buick's wren is really recognizable by this broad white, really bold white eyebrow, and then a brownish eye line. And wrens tend to have bills that are slightly down curved like this. And this guy is all clean undersides. They are cavity nesters. Just one year they nested in this cavity up in the eaves of my house. And you can see all the barring on the tail, the barring on the wings and back. And there's that distinguished white eyebrow. Monomorphic, can't tell male from female. 
They even have barring on the undertail covers. To Christmas. Oh, yeah. Some of them hang around during the winter time. This guy looks like he wished he had gone home for the winter. Most of them migrate out of here though. And then this is the house rent. It's sort of nondescript, slightly decurved bill. Um, I don't know what to say about this. Maybe a, a faint eyebrow, mostly just this light brownish coloration, deeper brown on the back and the tail. And they will nest in, in fact, I've had several of them nest in my uh, nest boxes over the years. I've had Buick Ren nest in my nest boxes too. So they migrate out of here in the wintertime, come back in the spring. One characteristic of wrens is they often cock that tail up when they're perched like that. And this guy really cocks the tail up. That's really characteristic of wrens. Small birds, four and three quarters of them. LBJs, we call them, little brown jobs, the house wren. So there's the house wren compared to the Buick's wren. It's that eyebrow and the more chocolatey color, I call it, on the upper sides of the Buick's wren that helps me recognize it from the house wren. Yellow rumped warbler, also known as Audubon's warbler. These guys uh, come up here in the uh, spring and summer, <laughs> although some of them actually hang around all winter. Uh, strongly dimorphic, the males have all this bright coloration, yellow on the crown, yellow on the chin and throat, some yellow on the side, this bluish grayish coloration with black stripes on it, <coughs> black on the sides there and then whitish underneath. There you can see the yellow on the crown, yellow on the chin and throat and the sides, and this is why they're called the yellow rumped warbler, yellow on the rump, which you may not see if the bird is perched like that. <coughs> if it separates its wings, you can see it. And these white spots in the tail. They tend to be birds that go up into the forest, the pine forest. But in the wintertime, they can come down here. The males will molt into a female-like plumage. And I get several hanging around in my yard all wintertime. Yellow rumped warbler or autobot warbler. And of course, we get hummingbirds here too. Come spring, up comes the black chinned hummingbirds, which I usually always get in my yard coming to my feeders, called black chin for obvious reasons. The chin and throat look black. The area where the coloration occurs is called the gorget. They have to turn their head in just the right angle to your eye, and the light has to hit at just the right angle so you can see that they're really not all black. At the bottom of the gorget, they've got this purple band. That's the black male black chin hummingbird. Females, very dull color. They're the ones that build the nest. They're the ones that lay the eggs and raise the young. Males don't do it at all. All the males do is sit around and try to attract females, breed with as many females as they can. And the females go off and do all the parental duties on their own. And in most hummingbird species, the females are much duller colored than the males. Here's another one that you can get maybe in your yard, especially if you're south of town. Good place to see this one, the Calliope hummingbird, with this gorgeous V-shaped purple gorget, and is a Davis Creek campground. Go up into the campground there, walk up along the creek, and there's one there almost every year. Three inches, this is the smallest bird in North America. The Calliope hummingbird, only three inches long. Like all hummingbirds, if the light doesn't hit the gorget at just the right angle to your eye, it will look black. But if they turn and the light hits it just right, wham, they hit you with that burst of color. So there's the calliope hummingbird with that purple gorget. And then there's Anna's hummingbird. Now, when I first moved up here in 1970, I never heard of Anna's hummingbirds here in Nevada. But over the years, over the decades, they've evidently been coming over the hill, as we say. And now I have friends who say they have Anna's hummingbirds nesting in their yard. They seem to occur more on the western side of the city than in the eastern. And I was surprised to actually see this guy in my yard this year. Anna's hummingbird has got this, what do they call it, rose colored, I guess, uh, gorget, and it's also up on the head. Again, light doesn't hit it right. It looks black. Turn the head a little bit and you start to see some of the color on the gorget and the side and up on the head. Get the light just right hitting the bird and you got this gorgeous rose color or whatever you want to call it, purple or reddish gorget and head and it's hummingbird. Some of them hang around all winter. I know some people have said they've had anise hummingbirds uh, coming to their feeder all winter long. So be on the lookout for anise hummingbirds. Okay, let me finish up with a few migrants and some winter birds, assuming I have enough time. Um, these guys, the rufous hummingbird, rufous meaning that reddish brown, gorgeous orange gorget, which doesn't show well here, but the rufous all over the 
head and the back and the, and the lower belly and so on. These guys pass through in the spring. You only got maybe a week or two to see them as they go north to breed up into the mountains and up into the far north. And then they start coming back again in the fall through, um, oh, I say late July and August, you'll see rufous hummingbirds coming through again on their way south. Look at all that rufous on the head and the back and tail. And the gorget here doesn't show the bright orange because the light isn't hitting it at the right angle. Rufous hummingbird. Another migrant is the hermit thrush. This guy is a thrush. It's related to our American robin. A um, little bit smaller, six and three quarter inches. You recognize it by this kind of reddish, almost rufous color in the tail and in the wings. And this pale eye ring that goes completely around the eye. The beak is smaller than that of a robin, but robin-like. If you see it from the front, it's got all these spots. But notice the spots are all triangular. They're triangular spots on the breast and down onto the belly. That's the hermit thrush. Now, I sometimes get them in the winter time. Some of them hang around in the winter. Other times they just, I only see them in fall or spring as they're migrating through. So I consider this, they're a breeding bird here, quite honestly. Uh, they breed up in the, in, the, uh, in the woods, in the forest and up in the mountains. But for me, I only see them as migrants or perhaps a winter bird in my yard, the hermit thrush. Chipping sparrow, to me, another one of the first signs of spring. The chipping sparrows tend to, tend to go up and breed in the uh, pine forest. Uh, they like to be somewhere near the open meadows where they go down on the grass to feed. It's a sparrow, only five and a half inches long, another LBJ as we call it, little brown jobby. So it's streaking on the upper part of the back, grayish back here. But notice it's got a rufous cap. It's the only sparrow with a rufous cap. <clears throat> and the rufous cap is bordered by a sort of a grayish to whitish eyebrow, a black eyelash. So rufous cap, whitish to grayish eye, uh, eyebrow, and a black eye line, you've got a chipping sparrow. All clear on the underside, no streaks or spots or anything. Often seen down on the ground, feeding in an open meadow somewhere. They will come to a feeder um, as they're passing through in the lower valley to get up to the higher elevations. They will come to your feeder and there's another view from the side. In the fall, when the young come through, this is what the young birds look like, the chipping sparrow. They don't have the red cap, they've got this brown and blackish and light orange stripe, uh, streaking on the head. Uh, and there's sort of an eyebrow and a black eye line. They don't look like the adults at all. And a lot of people will see this chipping sparrow and have no idea what it is. It's a immature or juvenile chipping sparrow headed south for the winter. These guys, I get lots of these in my yard every winter. The white crown sparrow, named for obvious reasons. The white, what we call the white median line, median meaning middle white median line on the crown, bordered by a black line. Then there's a whitish eyebrow and a black eye line. The rest of the bird is grayish, clear underneath, grayish back here, brown and white stripes on the back, seven inches long, just one of the largest of our sparrows. All clear underneath, very recognizable head pattern there, grayish on the sides. And there's this kind of brown and light tan streaking on the upper part of the back. The rest of it is just bare brown white crown sparrow. Here it is compared to a house sparrow. Seven inches compared to six and a quarter inches, about the same size. And they come to my feeders all winter long. Now, people see this white crown sparrow and they think it's a female, but it's not. This is a first year bird, the juvenile. The adults are monomorphic. You can't tell male from female. So when you see this guy, this is a juvenile bird, a bird of the year. Notice they don't have the black and white. They've got these brown lateral stripes, sort of a tan median stripe. They do have a, a light eyebrow and a black eye line. But the rest of the bird tends to look like the adults. So here you go. That's an adult white crown sparrow. That's a juvenile. That's not a female and a male. That's an adult, can't tell male from female. That's a juvenile white crown sparrow. Here's a juvenile white crown sparrow compared to a female house sparrow at my old, uh, <clears throat> my old uh, water source, my old fountain. About the same size, a little bit bigger than the house sparrow. Easy to tell apart, of course, because of the head pattern. And remember those orangish and blackish streaks on the back of the uh, female house sparrow that separates it from the streaking on the white crown sparrow. 
Now, if you've got white crown sparrows, juveniles in your yard, late winter, early spring, keep an eye on them, watch the head. You'll see them molt into their adult plumage. See the brown streak there, black and white streaks starting to come in. This guy and this guy, they're starting to molt into their first adult plumage. Brownish from the juvenile plumage, black coming in, black and white on the head. Another bird that I get in my yard in the winter time that looks like the white crown sparrow is called the golden crown sparrow. This part of the body looks practically identical to white crown, but look at the head. Golden crown because of this yellow on the top of the crown and bordered by black lines. They are ground feeders like the uh, white crown sparrows, although they will come to your hopper feeder, but their head pattern is different. Easy to recognize a golden crown sparrow from a white crown sparrow. And they too will be molting in the late winter, early spring. These little, you can see the feathers coming in. We call these pin feathers because when the feathers first come in, they're surrounded by a sheet that looks like a pin. So there's all these pin feathers coming in and you see the yellow coming in on the head and some of the black and so on. And boy, when they're molting, they can, <laughs> they can look really shabby like this guy. Okay, golden crown sparrow at my bird bank. <laughs> Another one I get in the winter time, not as many as I used to for some reason, the dark-eyed junco, also called the Oregon junco. They're dimorphic. Uh, males are more brightly colored than the females. You've got this black head and nape, and across the breast we refer to it as the hood, which contrasts with this pinkish or flesh-colored beak. They may have a varying amount of orange on the back, blackish on the wings and tail, white outer tail feather, and some yellowish uh, or orangish on the sides. Here's another view of another, oops, another male dark-eyed junco, darkish head, pinkish beak. There's some of that orangish wash on the upper part of the back, orangish along the side versus the brownish feathers. Females are not as brightly colored as the male. There's the male with that dark black hood and breast. Females are grayish, grayish head and vest extending onto the back. So it's easy to tell a male from a female dark-eyed junco. Different coloration, dimorphic. So here's a male here on the ground. There's a female. Yeah, it looks like, a, sometimes it's hard to tell. That seems lighter to me. I'm suspecting that's a female, whereas this is definitely a male. And then again, the white outer tail feathers. This is really distinctive when the bird takes flight. The tail opens up and the white tail feathers flash, flash, I'm sorry, flash as the bird flies away. And it's easy to recognize a dark-eyed junco as it's flying up from the ground because of those white outer tail feathers. Another bird we get here in the wintertime is the Cassin's finch. This is a male, they're dimorphic. This one looks a lot like a house finch. Reddish on the head, chin and throat, red back here on the rump. But there are some distinct differences. There's the rump, there's the head, all of this down here. Cassin's finch, the entire head is red, not just the forehead, see? The entire head is red. And sometimes, man, they can really look red throughout most of the body, much more reddish than a house finch. To compare it to a house finch down here, house finches, here's a Cassin's finch. They can raise their feathers up in a crest. House finches don't, no crest. Notice forehead and then eyebrow on the house finch. The entire head is red and there's kind of a pinkish eyebrow here on the, uh, the male Cassin's finch. Another strong difference, if you're not sure of the head, check the beak. The upper mandible of a Cassin's finch is always straight. The upper mandible of a house finch, both male and female, is always curved. That's an easy way to tell Cassin's from house finch when you've got them both together in the wintertime. Cassin's finches are usually breeding up in, in pine forest, but in the wintertime, they'll often come down and I'll often get them at my finch feeders, okay? Red head and crest on a Cassin's finch, forehead only and eyebrow on the house finch. Straight upper mandible on the Cassin's finch, curved upper mandible on the house finch. Also, the Cassin's finch has got a clear undersides, whereas house finches, they've got streaking on the sides and the belly. Another way to tell them apart. Clear breast and belly on the Cassin's finch, streaking on the undersides of the house finch. All right, two of them. 
not happy with each other. Now, here's a Cassin's finch raising its feathers up in a crest. Here's a house finch in the back. Straight upper mandible. Notice the curved upper mandible on the male house finch. Females, they can raise the feathers up in a, uh, in a crest too. And they've got these brown streaking. They look a lot like a female house finch. My impression is that the streaking on the female house finch tends to be oh, broader, thicker streaks. Whereas on the female house finch, they seem, seem to be finer streaks to me. But that's just my impression. Female can also lower those feathers too. But you can also see that straight upper mandible on the female Cassin's finch. Thick, black, uh, thick brown streaking on the underside. Now, if you're anywhere up near a forest, like living up along, you know, Mount Rose Forest, up in the Galena Forest area and so on, these guys inhabit um, the pine forest up there and they're, they're um, permanent residents. They're around all year, but for people like myself who live down in the valley, I only see them in the wintertime if I see them at all. This is a mountain chickadee, only five and a quarter inches, monomorphic, just a grayish bird with black and white on the head and face. White eyebrow, black eye line, a black chin and throat, kind of like a bib, white along the face here, and the rest of the bird is just gray. Look like this up close. There's the white eyebrow, there's the black, I'm sorry, black eyebrow, and there's a white uh, line above it. So now I guess this would be more of an eye line, and that's an eyebrow, I guess. All right. Mountain chickadee. And then there's three nut hatches that are permanent residents up in the forest. The white-breasted, the red-breasted, and the pygmy. The white-breasted is the largest of the three, five and three-quarter inches. White-breasted, for obvious reasons, all white down here. The nut hatches have this chisel-like bill, which they use to, to chisel nuts out of the pine cone. And then they'll go and they'll take the nuts over to something like these cracks in here, crevices, and they'll stick the, uh, the pine nut in there, and they'll come back and feed on it later. So notice this guy's got this black line across the back here, and then kind of this bluish gray coloration throughout the rest of the bird. And nut hatches have these short, stubby, square tails too, all three of them. Here's another look at the white breasted nut hatch from underneath. There's that chisel shaped bill. And all this white here, that black eye sort of stands out as like a black bead surrounded by white when you see them. And they often go down to the ground and feed on the ground. Um, they Undertail covers the chrysomite, you can see it is a chestnut color. And then the black and white pattern here kind of reminds you a little bit of a mountain chickadee. Here's a red breasted nut hatch, named for obvious reason, the red on the breast. Black and white pattern, again, which would kind of remind you of a mountain chickadee. And the rest is this bluish gray, uh, bluish gray coloration with a square cut tail again. Two more views of a red breasted nut hatch. And this is I apologize for this. I have no idea why my PowerPoint keeps doing this. This is another characteristic pose of nut hatches in general. They can go up a tree head first. They can go down a tree head first. They can go across a branch on the top. They can turn around and go upside down underneath the branch. These nut hatches are often referred to as the acrobats of the bird world because of the way they can go around and under and up and down and so on. Usually recognizable black and white face, reddish on the undersides reddish on the undersides and the black and white pattern on the face again, red-breasted nuthatch. Viewed from above, there's the black and white on the head and face, the bluish gray here, and you can see some of the red there. And they are cavity nesters, all the nuthatches are. They may either dig the hole themselves or they may use another hole that they find somewhere. This is the pygmy nuthatch, the smallest of the three, only four and a quarter inches long. All three of these will come to your nut hatch or will come to your suet feeders uh, during the winter time, or some of them even during the summer if you're living up in the woods. There's the pygmy nut hatch, just kind of dull, bluish gray, all whitish underneath. All the nut hatches are monomorphic. There's another classic pose, pygmy nut hatch. And there's the acrobatic pose. This guy's hanging upside down looking for insects on that part <coughs> of the pine tree branch. Three nut hatches, and they occur all across North America. They're not uh, unusual to Nevada. They're all across North America. Uh, one of the surprises in the wintertime is this guy, one of my favorite birds, one of my wife's favorite birds, the cedar waxwing, named for this cedar-like waxy tips on the edge of this part of the wing. They have a white chrism, 
yellowish here, brownish all over here, and they have a crest which they can raise up or they can lay down. And they have what we call a black mask and yellow at the tip of the tail. So here's a look at it from underneath. There's the black mask, a Zorro mask, I guess you'd call it. Black on the underneath the, the chin there. There's the yellow on the tip of the tail. They're monomorphic, can't tell male from female. They're about seven and a quarter inches long, so just smaller than a robin. And they like to eat juniper berries. So if you've got junipers in your yard producing berries, look for these guys in the wintertime, okay? And they come to the bird bath, drink and bathe. And notice not all of them have these wax on the tips. There's waxy tips on that one, but these guys, none of these have them. I have no idea why some have it and others don't. I've never been able to find out. But uh, keep an eye on them. So if you can find some with waxy tips like this, drinking at your bird bath. And then finally, let me finish with one called the pine siskin. This one often drives beginning birders nuts because you look at it and you say, what the heck kind of a sparrow is that? I mean, it's brownish, it's streaky, it looks like a sparrow. But not all of them have this, but some do. Some will have yellowish in the wings like that. And if you see yellowish in the wings, you know it's not a sparrow. And look at that beak. That beak is not as cone-shaped as it is in most sparrows, as I'll show you in a minute. That keys you up to the pine siskin. Pine siskins, as the name implies, are way up in the pine forest, usually often up around tree line. But they will come down in the wintertime, and I'll get them at my feeders from time to time in the yard. But if you're not sure, check the beak. See how thin that beak is with a thin tip? Compare that to the thick cone-shaped beak of this golden crown sparrow, the uh, thick cone-shaped beaks of these finches. That beak alone will key you off to the fact that it's not a sparrow or a finch, it's a pine siskin. And if you can see yellow in the wing, like this, and yellow at the base of the tail, then you definitely know, along with that beak, you've got a pine siskin. Here it is on my finch feet. And you see, you see the yellow in the wings, um, much easier when the bird flies. You've got this yellow wing bar that goes across the wing, and there's the yellow at the base of the tail. So I thank you for your attention. I've gone probably longer than I should have. There's lots more we could talk about, but enough for now. Happy birding. Hope you have some good birding. And if anybody has any questions, I will let Parker throw them at me. Parker? Parker, are you there? I'm here. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen for a moment, Alan? Yes. There you are. Yeah, and there you are. Okay, so yes, uh, I did have a, um, there was one question which was uh, um, about uh, scrub jays. Do you know how scrub jays remember where they bury the peanuts they've cached? Uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, there was a, there's a fellow at the university here in Reno. Um, his name is Dr. Stephen Vanderwall. Uh, he did some research with um, Clark's nutcrackers, which are in the same family as the Jays. And he found that what the, the Clark nutcrackers are the champions of, of pine nut caching. They cache literally tens of thousands of nuts every year and use them to feed their young. Even in the wintertime, they, they nest earlier than most birds. They evidently remember the location because of the objects that are next to the location. A rock here, a twig there, uh, a log over there. He did experimental uh, uh, experiments with him where he had him in an aviary and uh, he would mark the location of the caches and he would have various objects on the ground, a rock, a stone, a twig, a branch or so on. So on a map, he mapped out where the location of the caches were. Then he moved these other objects a certain distance, say like about 10 millimeters or three inches or whatever. Released the birds again after having not fed them for a day or two. They went over and started digging where the objects were off about equal to the distance at which he had moved the objects from the actual cache. So they obviously were keying on the location the objects around the cache. So I suspect all the other jays do the same thing. The jays are related to the nutcrackers. So I would say it's uh, location, 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 the objects near the cache that they memorize. They have this incredible, what we call incredible spatial memory.
to remember all of those. So that's my best guess on that. Excellent, excellent. Uh, yeah. You see, there's one question here. Is it up? Sally Moore says, I was listening to a program recently that said both male and female robins have red breasts. That's what we used to call them when I was a kid growing up in Pennsylvania, robin red breast. Um, to me, they look more orange and they both do have the reddish or orangish breast. It's the head that differs during the breeding season. Now, when the breeding season is over and you get into late, uh, late summer and then all through winter, I see a lot of what look like female robins. And I can't imagine that they're all females. What I suspect is the young birds have molted into their first adult plumage, but the young birds I suspect all look like the female. So I get these flocks of robins coming into my, uh, my uh, feeder and my, and my fountain. And most of them look like female robins. I suspect what I've got is females and young birds that have molded into their first winter plumage. So I would say that they both have red, uh, excuse me, reddish oranges breast, but it's the head that makes them differ. The male with the black head, the female with the grayish head. Anything else? Um, I haven't had anything submitted. Uh, for those of you still on the air, uh, if you want to submit it, uh, now is the time. Uh, just click on the Q&A button and uh, ask a question. Uh, Otherwise, uh, we will uh, move on. Uh, um, uh, this person uh, says, great webinar. Thank you. And uh, thank you. says, love the talk and your enthusiasm. Yeah, I, th I thank you for your patience and sticking with me, especially with the way my dog on uh, PowerPoint just kept hopping forward and backward on me. It just drove me nuts. So mm -hmm. I hope it didn't bother you people too much. Yeah, so unfortunately, our guests can't give you a uh, applause like this, Alan, but uh, I've gotten several uh, thank yous on the Q&A. Well, they don't need to clap. All they need to do is send me money. Mm -hmm. I always say, no, no clapping, no clapping, just throw money, throw money. So anybody who wants to, I'll give you my address and you can mail me money to say thank you. I'm kidding, of course. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you again, everybody, for listening. I suspect we are done now, right? Yes, we are done now. Uh, um, once again, yes, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, tune in next week where we are honored to have Alan present again. This time, uh, he will be doing a special lecture all on the raptors of northern Nevada. Well, not exactly all the raptors, just hawks. Of northern, uh, Nevada. Awesome. of northern Nevada. Okay, hope some of you will join me. Thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Bye-bye. Goodbye.